Amazing. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. All right, cool. What's up, everybody? I'm so excited to be here with you today. Who's been having an amazing time throughout the day? I love this curation, Kelly, that you got going on and super girl power in the room. Um, I'm actually calling you guys while traveling, so uh, not my usual setup, but the, the delightfulness of technology makes it possible to talk to you from wherever. So listen, I know we got a lot of different instruments in the house, right? We got different instrumentalists, singers, um, I myself, rock the saxophone, singing, writing my own songs, band lighting since I was the age of 12. And um, throughout my career, I have actually always been a band leader and at this point played over 900 concert concerts with my band in over 30 countries and music has been this incredible gift to me and being able to connect with people all around the world bring my music bring my joy um i'm just curious how many of you are like looking to pursue this even more further you know in in your careers and I know I can't really see the chat right now, but if that's you, like put your hand up <laughs> because get pumped because I want to talk to you girls today about the importance of building confidence. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions as we go about this time together so that you can maybe even, if you got a note, a notepad, write down some thoughts that you might be having and certainly write down some things that I'm talking about that might kind of like hit home and you might want to work on yourself. Um, you know, I think as a young lady, and I'm going to talk from my my voice here, I think a lot of you might be in high school, right? Maybe we have some younger folks as well and some older folks. I was actually really shy when I was growing up. Um, I was always very, I mean, let me say like very social with my friends and all that, but I was definitely not the person that you might think would be like the performer and would walk into a room and be like, ta-da! I'm the type that like, I love to listen to people. I love to be in conversation, but like when you see the performance me and I'm out there and I'm big, like that's not necessarily how I am in person. And it's definitely not how I was when I was growing up. I'd be really nervous about like meeting people. If I went to see a show and saw a musician that I admire, like I'd be so nervous to talk to them or like, I wouldn't know what to say, right? Is that any of you? Um, and building confidence is so, so important for you as a, a human being, for you as a musician, for any of you who want to become performing artists and a band leader. And it's not something that you just have or you don't have, right? Like some people might have grown up in households or grown up in households that they feel like they can present themselves and they feel a little bit more confident. But even if you're the type that feels like you have zero confidence, I don't want you to think that, that you just can't you can't ever have it. We all need to continue working on building our confidence. Things that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later are things that I continually do as a person, um, as a musician, as a band leader, and it doesn't just come you know, naturally. So if you're the type that maybe is a little shyer to raise your hand, you know, or if I asked if you're in jazz band and maybe there's a lot of guys around. I know when I was growing up playing in my jazz bands, I was usually like the only I was a lot, a lot of times the only girl, or maybe there was a couple of us. And I'd get very self-conscious about that at times. And I wasn't necessarily the one who would raise my hand to say, oh, I'll improv next, you know. Um, but it's actually in doing all of this acts, those small acts that one can every day practice being a little bit more courageous, right? Practice being a little bit more confident. And a lot of it comes from here of thinking about visualizing yourself as that person or almost like tricking yourself right to 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 embody that confident version of you and then you'll be able to step by step you'll be able to grow into it um i have this story for all of you of a moment that i was on stage and i was like what the heck am i doing i was so freaking nervous i didn't feel confident in that moment at all and I basically tricked my way, I faked my way to come across to my audience as confident because after the fact, I was, sh you, you guys, I was like shaking in this particular moment that I'm gonna tell you about in, in, in a minute. Um, 
I felt like a, a fraud. I just didn't feel like I should be there in this moment, like playing on national TV. And um, I learned a lot of lessons in that moment. So I'm going to kind of use that story as like kind of a jumping off point. So uh, a few years ago, I was invited by my dear friend, John Batiste. If you don't know him, look him up. Great pianist, entertainer, um, singer, originally from New Orleans. But he, for a few years now, has been the band leader for the TV show, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, which is the top uh, late show program. And in their first year, I was invited by John to come join the house band for what was only supposed to be two weeks and turned into six months. And it was an insanely amazing gig. I was living in LA right before that. So I basically moved to New York City. I grew up in Boston and I always just thought New York was just the most amazing creative place, but I never ever imagined that I'd live there. So that was a treat in itself. And every day I was commuting to Times Square we would perform at the Ed Sullivan Theater, uh, right in the heart of, you know, Midtown. And every day when we would film, I'd be, I'd be in the TV studio from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. The actual filming time would be like four o'clock and we would go out in front of an audience of like 500 people that would fill the Ed Sullivan Theater back when <laughs> we could have the, that many people in a crowd pre-COVID, right? And we would warm up at the crowd by just playing songs. It was so much fun. But um, I'm going to take you back to my very first day um, when I was, I got the call from John literally three days before showing up in the studio. Um, I was in town visiting New York City and I get this text on my phone. And it's John, and we've actually known each other for years. We've played past gigs together. I was a special guest with him and his band at the Blue Note at, at Newport Jazz Festival, many really cool things. And John later went on to, to uh, record on one of my albums. And anyways, the text was from John. He was like, hey, what's up? How you doing? Um, I was just wondering, like, what, what are all the instruments that you play? You know, and I'm like, he's like, I know you play alto sax, but do you play any of the other saxes? And do you play clarinet? Now, Everybody, I had not played clarinet since fourth grade. Um, you know, it had been over 10 years of even holding a clarinet. I played clarinet before saxophone, but it just never really did well. Like I was squeaking, I was squawking. If anyone here plays clarinet, hats off to you. <laughs> and um, in my career, and this is something I want you to all think about and maybe write down for when these future opportunities come your way, I found that even in moments that you feel insecure and you feel like if someone said to you, like John said to me, do you play clarinet? I could kind of smell that there might be an opportunity coming on the end of that. And um, I went ahead and I said, yes, I play, I do play clarinet, right? Cause I had played it a long time ago. And in my mind, I was like, I can always brush off on the brush up on the instrument. So I always encourage people, especially when they're early on in their music career to say yes as much as possible to opportunities that might even scare you because you think there's no way I could possibly do that. There's no way I'm possibly ready. Well, just to let you know, there's like never a moment where you are ready, right? So you got to say yes, and then you'll figure it out. So, you know, I wrote back to John's text and I was like, yeah, I mean, I play alto. I play some, some of the soprano sax, you know, I sing. Uh, yeah, I play some clarinet. Again, like, clarinet and saxophone are completely different beasts I don't know in my head I'm like okay well this is probably for something way down the future right and he goes cool cool it's great um hey what are you doing on Monday it was Friday uh and I was like um you know no plans and he goes um I'd love for you to join the house band for the tv show and um I'd love for you to play the saxes and clarinet are you, are you into it? And now my heart is like beating a, a mile a minute, right? I'm like, oh my God, this is such an insane opportunity. Plan on national television. It's three days away. And he's asked, and I just said that I play clarinet, right? And I don't really, <laughs> I don't play clarinet. Um, but what did I do? I said, yes, I'm going to be there. I mean, there's no way I was going to pass up that opportunity. Um, and this is where I said to all of you, you say yes, 
and then you figure it out after. You rise to the occasion when the occasion shows itself and you're gonna figure it out. Um, and so then I think I said to him, you know, well, how much clarinet are we talking about? <laughs> you know? And he said, oh, I think maybe you could play about half of clarinet and half saxophone. Now my heart is really racing, right? Because not only everybody, did I not play clarinet in over 10 years, I didn't have the instrument. Um, and then he also said, could you play baritone sax? I can play baritone sax. The last time I had picked up a baritone sax was in eighth grade. Again, it's been over 10 years. I didn't have the instrument. So what do I do? This is where problem solving comes in. And this is where your brain, which has a lot to do with also going about life and going about opportunities in a confident way. I said, I am going to figure this out. I have a network of people that can help me. And that's the other thing that's very important to remember, right? In moments that you rise to the occasion, that's where you call upon your mentors. That's where you call upon other people who have done the thing that you want to do, who have the experience. This is very, very important here, right? When you're in moments like this, or moments that you want to do something, or you, you told somebody, yes, I'll be there, and you have no idea idea what to do. You want to talk to people who have done that thing, right? If you want to go and record an album, you never done that before. And you want to be a band leader, you need to go talk to someone who's done that. And it's really important because I think people have talked about this about talking to somebody, you know, if you want to climb a mountain, you need to talk to somebody who's conquered that mountain and climbed it, not other people who haven't climbed a mountain, because those people are going to tell you, oh, it's too scary. You can't do that. Don't do it. Like I'd never do it. But the person who's already climbed the mountain would tell you, oh yeah, you just need to get this gear and that gear and you need to train X amount of time. Like they're the mentality of people who have done the thing you want to do is the people that you want to align with. If you're really serious about getting to a certain point in your musical practice and your career, wherever you want to take this, right? Just in life. And as a mentality thing, I always try to surround myself with people who are the best at what they do because I want to learn. And I not only want to learn how to kind of like get there, I want to see like big strides. So I've been incredibly fortunate in my, in my um, career and I've worked really hard to get great at what I do and then to, you know, be able to study with mentors that the opportunity came up, people like, the late great Lee Conants, who played in Miles Davis Monette and on that historical record, Birth of the Cool, Phil Woods, Frank Morgan, they saw what I was doing, they saw my talent, and then I was incredibly forever grateful to be under their wings growing up. But let me get back to the story here, right? Okay, so what did I do as soon as the, then the text thread ended, I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna go into Ed Sullivan Theater on Monday in three days. I haven't touched the clarinet in 10 years. I haven't touched the baritone sax in 10 years. I don't have these instruments. I don't know how to play it. And I just committed myself to an insane gig and I really wanna do well, you know? So first thing I did, I called up my contacts at Yamaha. I endorse Yamaha and at that time I, I was as well. And they said, Ooh, take a deep breath, Grace. This is, first of all, this is amazing. What an incredible opportunity. And we got you. And um, you can come into the Midtown office, you know, um, later today, we're going to hook you up with the horns. Feel free to use the practice studio. I mean, they have my back and they're like, we got you on the instruments. Then I called up my, my contacts at Van Doren because I've been endorsing Van Doren products for a long time and I love them. And they said, again, wow, Grace, amazing, right? Put it in perspective for me um because I was freaking out and they're like come in we got you we're gonna set you up with all the mouthpieces like so the first thing I did I just got the, the horns together and then I, I just started practicing like crazy over the weekend but here it was like a real kicker everyone I had asked John what music should I prepare what should I learn can you send me music and the response was you'll just have to come in and I don't have music to send you right? It's like, this is not something I could prepare for because the way that John works is he makes things up in the moment. He's from New Orleans. Like they hit the streets. They just make up songs. He makes up songs. And in the past, when I work with him, sometimes I only learn the song like the day of the performance because we're learning it by ear. So it was very much that vibe. And so I called up another friend in the band. I was like, man, what, do I, what should I prepare? 
you know, because I like to be prepared. Also very important. And he said, honestly, it could be anything. You got to be ready. You know how John rolls, just bring some manuscript paper. And then he said, learn the theme song. So I spent the whole weekend going through Stephen Colbert clips on YouTube, trying to find any song that I could recognize or learn. Also had to learn the theme song on all these different instruments because I didn't know which one he'd be, you know, which instrument he'd want me to play. There's a lot of question marks, a lot of uncertainty there, you know. So there, I walk in Monday morning to this shiny brand new Head Sullivan Theater. You know, there's people coming at me, uh, production people saying, hi, I'm from here. Hair and makeup, huh? I'm from wardrobe. Like, what do you have for wardrobe? Or you must be so excited. And my head's just everywhere. Stephen Colbert is in the corner being like, hey, who are you? You know, he just lights camera. I'm an in ear monitors, which, if you don't know, that's like when um, that's where you hear all the music in your ears, especially from, from uh, uh, if you don't have monitors in front of you. So I was like, oh my gosh, setting up these instruments that I barely know. And um, I'm going to fast forward here to say I learned a few new songs by ear one hour before the show, you know, so, and I still didn't know what instruments I, were, I was going to play it on, because that's kind of the way that John will roll of, like, you'll learn on one instrument, and then he might say to you, okay, now play it on clarinet, literally with the audience there. So um, I'm really, really nervous, and um, the show starts, right? It's my first time in, the tele in a national television studio. There's these huge cameras that are craning over. There's 500 people in front of me screaming. It's like freezing cold in the studio. And um, I remember, so the band would often play the bumper music, which is like, you know, 30 seconds to maybe, yeah, 30 seconds from Stephen Colbert saying, all right, we're going to take a, a commercial break, bumper music, and then into commercials. But the bumper music actually continues in the studio for like those four minutes in front of an audience. Um, and I, uh, I saw some questions are coming in. I love it, by the way. Um, somebody's saying, do you remember all the fingerings for those? Um, I, sorry <laughs> i was just getting called i did not know the fingerings for those instruments and at that point i got really nervous right how many of you have gotten nervous well right before hitting the stage even thinking about performing so didn't really know the songs i was going to play didn't feel confident about the fingerings i was going to play i mean if you if i was playing alto and doing my main thing i'd be like ready to rock it there's a lot of i don't knows so the first commercial is coming upon the break. I got my in ears. We're playing this jam. And then I hear John saying in my in ears, Grace, pick up the clarinet, clarinet solo, clarinet solo. And at this time, the giant crane with the um, camera is, is literally panning towards me. Right. And the really wild thing about TV being on TV, you guys, is like, you gotta look great too. I'm like smiling, even though I feel like a headless chicken inside, but it's like, you don't want your audience to ever know that you're unconfident or, or stressed out. So I'm trying to look cool. Crane is coming to me and then I'm hearing John be like, clarinet, so I grab the clarinet. And then he goes, get on the blacktop. I have no idea what the blacktop is. So I start looking over at Eddie. I'm looking over at Eddie and John. I'm like, what's the blacktop? And they point to the, the black granite floor um, right in front of the piano. It's basically like, kind of the solo area. So I walk out with a clarinet, the camera's in my face, the crowd's getting going nuts. I still don't know what's next. And John goes, now solo. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm on clarinet. I don't even know how to really play this instrument. And so this is where the topic of confidence comes in, everybody, right? So I had, a, in, a, in a millisecond, in that moment, I had a few, I had a couple options. I could just, cave in to myself and the feelings being like you don't know how to do this you don't play clarinet you're a you're a fraud you're a phony you shouldn't be here right and i or there was the other way which is you're gonna step up to a hot plate and you are going to play solo on clarinet and you're gonna own this moment and even though you are feeling so unconfident in this moment you are just gonna bring everything you have and make it look like make it feel like 
you're going to play solo. And that's exactly what I did because the first option is not an option in my mind. And so I knew that if I stuck to the higher register on the clarinet, I actually feel more comfortable there because that's like the saxophone fingerings, right? So I just started at it. I was like, I started to, to within my parameters of what I knew, which wasn't really anything comfortable, I started to uh, play, right? And then it gets even more complicated. Then John starts soloing on piano. He's a super virtuosic pianist. And he wanted to trade like eights with me and then he'd kick it back. And then I'm like, ah, blah, 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 blah. and that was the first time you can, I, I, that was the first time my face was on a Stephen Colbert bumper was holding the clarinet, playing a solo. Afterwards, everyone was like, that was so fantastic. You know, and I'm still feeling like at the end of this, like, oh my God, like, what did I play? What did I, that was like, I don't know. It all went by so fast. How many of you have felt that in a performance? Like, Oh, I think I did something. I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether to feel proud of it or not. Um, and afterwards, I'm getting texts and messages from parents, friends, like, wow, you did so amazing. I had no idea you played clarinet. <laughs> and I'm like, I had no idea either. And the the whole team at, in the studio was saying, that was great. We had no idea you're a multi-instrumentalist playing all these, these instruments. And during those six months, I really... Um, I really became familiar with getting outside of my comfort zone because John would often say, now pick up the baritone sax. And then I later started to incorporate all these instruments in my own band leading. Because remember, I'm also at this time, I'm primarily a band leader. That gig was a very unusual one for me because everything else I was doing and that I've been doing since I was, since I was 12 is to be out there leading my own band. So. Um, suddenly I had a position where I was playing in someone else's band an incredibly high, not only caliber, but with a lot of eyes on us, you know. Um, and so somebody's asking, did we rehearse? No, there was like, a, there was one hour of rehearsal where we learned the songs that we were going to play that day. And that's how those six months in the TV show band worked. I mean, TV show stuff moves at such fast speeds, everyone. It's literally like, we were memorizing three to four songs a day that we learned an hour before and then we're in hair and makeup and then you have to perform it live. And the other crazy thing is like, we didn't have lead sheets, right? Super, super important. These are like the greatest things you can develop is your ears. And I think everybody in that band, we all had such strong ears and we all are of the mentality of we've grown up improvising. We know how to make music together that we could all lean on each other, right? There was never like, a crazy moment where there wasn't a lot of written stuff so we're really just like playing off each other so um i want to take i'm looking at the chats as they come in but anyway that that's my story about when i felt incredibly unconfident on like such a on in a situation where there were so many eyes on me right and um and what i did in that moment and what you can do in any moment right if you're about to go up on stage and you're like, not quite feeling yourself, you know, what do you have to, you have two options. You can, you can tell yourself what, what I was saying initially of like, there's an option of being like, oh, I'm just, I'm not ready. I'm not good enough. Or you can rise to the occasion. And even if you don't feel like you have it in that moment, you can say, you know what? I may not be as perfectly ready as I was hoping to be, which by the way, it is important to practice, but there's gonna be moments that maybe you're like, oh, I wish I just had another week. Well, nothing's gonna change in this moment. No, no amount of practice is gonna help you here. So how about approaching it with just being like, I'm gonna nail this, I'm gonna give it all I got, I'm jumping into the deep end and I'm gonna do whatever I can do, which by the way, everybody includes having a body language and I could talk about this for hours. This is very hard to sum up in such a short amount of time, but it's important to kind of go into it with that mindset. So I have just very, very briefly some things that I want to talk to you all about that are exercises that you can start to practice. Um, I have noticed when watching some very talented younger girls who might be of your age who are in jazz bands that a lot of times if an opportunity came up, if the, the teacher said, hey, who wants to take a solo? She didn't raise her hand, right? And, a, 
And there's also been times that I've, I've heard some very talented young women that have been kind of holding back, right? They're not playing as loud as they could be. Not that we have to play loud, but I've just noticed there's a feeling of kind of holding back. There's a feeling of perfection. Like, I got to get this right. So something, if you're that type of person, right, you, maybe you just feel the urge. You want to, you want to be out there. You want to do it bigger. I, I want you to practice in your own practice routine, playing your instrument or singing as loud and ugly as possible. And I do this with the sax. I'm playing the long tones and stretching the sound so big and ugly. I would want to be outside of your practice room and be like, whoa, who's that? I want your parents to be like, oh my God, what is Lisa playing? Oh, sound too good. The exercise there is to embrace the ugliness, the non-perfection, the loudness, right? From there, you can always cultivate then a, a better sound, you can a better tone. But I've noticed that there's a lot of us, and I'm speaking ladies here, right, that just feel that perfection thing so heavily that we aren't wanting to kind of push the boundaries there. So great exercise for all of you, great sound exercise. I want you to get loud. I want you to get ugly. I want you to play it really, really big. Another very important thing about actually actively practice in your everyday life is little acts of courageousness, right? Like if you are the type that feels like if someone asks you, hey, um, do you want to play solo? And your initial reaction is like, oh my God, no, I'm not ready. I want you the next time that happens to say, yes, I'm going to play solo. Yes, me, right? Can can all of you commit to doing, and actually that's a big act. That's maybe you got to work up to that. And it could be something way smaller, right? Like I'm just going to give an example of um, say that I'm in conflict with my sister and maybe today is the day that I'm actually going to say to her, you know, that kind of hurt my feelings. And uh, I'd like to talk about how that feels. You know, that could be a very, that is an act of courageousness inside, right? You're building self-awareness. You're building growth. Whatever it is, and this does not have to be a musical thing because building confidence in general in your life is going to absolutely translate into your music. It's going to absolutely translate into your stage performance. So it's important, like there are times, everybody to this day too, and I practice this stuff on a regular, you got to shed the stuff that I think oh my God, this is going to be a tough conversation with this person. And I, I'd rather just email them instead of calling them, right? And that's the moment I catch myself and I say, you know what? I'm going to call them. You know, I think that's a better thing to do. I think that's going to be clear communication. It scares the crap out of me, but I'm going to do it. And I feel better every single time, even if it's awkward, even if it's weird, but that means the next time I'm like, you know, what? I did it that last time. So it's not as scary to pick up the phone and to do that. Or like, you know, remember that time that I played clarinet on national TV and I didn't feel like I was ready for it, but I didn't die. <laughs> like those are the moments that you really want to practice. So I just want you all to think about that. The next time something comes up, it can be a tiny thing. It can be a big thing. I want you to think about, hmm, maybe this is a moment that I can say yes. And I can dive into that thing. And remember in those moments, like even if you're saying yes to something that feels very daunting, I want you to always think about who are your mentors? Who are the teachers? Who are the people you can go to? Who are people you can reach out? Like you're not alone in this venture. And if you reach out to Kelly, you know, to your other mentors, like you're gonna find answers so the thing you're looking for, you're going to find guidance. And very often than not, if the person you reach out to doesn't have the answer, you know, and, and you have a close connection or you have a relationship at all and you're asking for you know, help, they'll say, you know, let me, let me ask if, uh, if Sharon has some ideas. So um, remember that also. It's not like you're going into this cold universe by yourself and having to strip bare and just scare it out of your mind. Um, there's a lot of ways to go about the stuff so that you can have the support, right? You have your friends, your family support, you have your teacher support as you do it. So I, I really recommend to all of you, 
you know, that practice that exercise, sound bad, sound big, sound ugly in, in the practice room. If you're a singer, what does it sound like to literally, you know, scream that note, belt that note, and, do, and try to do it without judging yourself. You want to practice those moments of courage and, and, and building confidence, even in those tiny decisions in your everyday life. Um, body language. I know we're running out of time, everybody, but um, I'll just kind of, let me just end with this one about body language and how important it is to, even if you don't feel like you can own the stage, the next time you're going to go up and play a solo, I want you to like walk into that solo in the front of the stage with a tall back. Just try it, right? You can, act, I actually recommend you practice this stuff at home. You put the camera up. I do this. I have the mirror. I have the camera up. I'm practicing all my stage performance and you cultivate confidence in your body. Here's one other thing that would be great for all of you. If you're soloing, how many of you have ever soloed it in the middle of it? You squeak, right? Or you squawk or your voice cracks or you mess up. Yes, me too. Totally. I want you to own those moments. If I was on stage right now and I started squeaking, what if you made your squeak a thing? What if you did it again? You know, like, what if you made an artistic statement based around that thing? So instead of caving, you know, I'm singing, ah, oops, maybe I've, this is jazz, right? You can make up your thing. Maybe right then is when I go, ah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I actually started when I was working on a lot of voice stuff, it was because my voice would crack and yodel that I started to find a sound by integrating exactly that. So that's definitely something to think about as well, right? Like, how can you own your mistakes? Remember that your audience does not know what you're supposed to do. So, um, you know, I want you to just remember these stories. I want you to remember those moments that come up. Really just think about what can I, what can I do to practice more confidence, courage in this moment? Um, I think, let me just look at the chat really quickly. Um, Ingrid is dying you a question oh, please yeah let's go for it i got a few more minutes so let's i just want to yeah i don't think anyone minds going a few extra minutes all right let's do it, Love it. sorry that's my dog um how how could i like measure my progress for improv like it's not something that's like you know like creativity isn't really quantitative so how could i like measure that sorry <laughs> I love, I love those puppies. Um, I think it's very important when you're actually in your routine, your practice routine, uh, to actually log things. So I have, you know, in, in my most, um, in the times that I was most working on my development, practicing, you know, every day, something as simple as, you know, how long did I practice today? What day is it? So you can look, you can look back and see what was your consistency? How long did you play? What exercises did you hit? What was hard? What wasn't hard? What do you need to work on next? Um, this is helpful in just being able to pick it up the next day and know exactly where you are. And, and also to be able to look back on that thing and say, oh, I feel like I didn't make any progress, but wow, last month I was actually working on this song that now I'm like totally nailing. So um, a lot of times when some of my students say like, how can I'm feeling kind of overwhelmed, confused with my practice session, even the simple act of starting to write things down and log it can be, can be helpful. And I always leave time. Um, I always leave time to jam it out at the end of my practice sessions. You gotta, you know, you, you have some very focused time in your practice session, you're working on scales, working on your arpeggios, you're working on repertoire, trans transposition, whatever it is. I spend the last 10, 15 minutes just jamming out with my favorite records, you know, put on, your favorite artist, your favorite song, and just forget all of that. And I think it's very, very important for all of you to end your practice session, what I call on a high note. You want to leave your instrument feeling in a positive way so that you want to pick it back up the next day, right? So um, you just want to close that book. So a lot of times jamming out allows me to feel really great at the end, just like, yeah, I want to hit it again tomorrow. Or if I'm writing a song, I'll actually stop at the peak 
of a very creative moment. I think this is actually a uh, writing technique Hemingway used. Like instead of finishing that thing, I just stop. He'd stop at like kind of a, a high point of the writing so that he could get back to it the next day. So yeah, you could try out some of those things and, and see how they feel. It's a great question. Thanks so much.